Okay, everybody, it is now 3.30 Friday uh, in Berlin. Um, and welcome, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for everybody for being here. Uh, my name is Tyson Barker and I'm the Deputy Director and Fellow at the Aspen Institute Germany here in Berlin. Um, I also head our tech program and I am delighted to have you guys all here today uh, for the second in a series that we're doing on COVID-19 and tech. Um, some of you were able to participate in our first uh, session with uh, Julian King, the former commissioner, uh, British commissioner at the European Union for Security Union. Uh, we had planned to do one with Saskia Eskin last week that has been bumped to the end. Having that, and we are delighted to have this discussion today, this sunny Friday on uh, AI and the fight against COVID. I think we're all in the in the interim become somewhat uh, experts in Zoom. You who haven't used Zoom in the past or are kind of new to it, um, please bear with us on the technology. The lines have become much stronger, um, but if you do have a bad connection, just disconnect and reconnect. Uh, if the voices sound metallic or anything, uh, that's the, that. Um, this discussion, just a couple of housekeeping notes at the top. First of all, this is on the record. Um, the entire discussion will be recorded and posted on YouTube. So we do want to have an interactive conversation. We're going to have some polls. We're going to open it up for questions and, and comments from the guests, the audience. Um, but all of that information, uh, be aware, be forewarned, you might be a YouTube celebrity before you know it. Um, we are doing this in partnership with Google. Uh, Google, as many of you guys know, has been just really, really proactive in trying to deploy technology uh, to fight this crisis. Uh, most recently, they have uh, created a partnership with Apple to try to make uh, you know, uh, Bluetooth low energy beacon systems available, contact tracing. And I know that they're doing a lot of work here in Germany um, as the apps are starting to develop PEP, PT and others. Uh, we will be hearing from uh, Google representatives in the future on data protection, on Germany's efforts to mobilize. So we are looking forward to hearing from them, uh, but they are very active and we are delighted to have them as a partner. Um, one more housekeeping note. Uh, we're gonna start off this conversation. We've got three great panelists, three great discussants, but later we are going to allow for questions and comments from the audience, as mentioned. If you have a question or comment, and we are at about, we speak, please just use the hand raising icon and then you can ask your question. Or if you would prefer to type your question, uh, you can type your question in the Q&A function down at the bottom. If you are dialing in, if you are on a dial-in phone, uh, all you have to do is hit star nine to ask a question and we'll make sure we get your questions as well. So those are the housekeeping notes and now we're gonna get on with the discussion. So we have, as mentioned, three excellent uh, discussants, a great cross section from uh, Germany, uh, France, and the UK are present, although the person in the UK is an American in this case. And I'll start with introducing her. Uh, Shannon Valor is the Bailey Gifford Chair in Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the Edinburgh Futures Institute at the University of Edinburgh. She also chairs Scotland's Data Delivery Group and is the author of several books, Technology and the Vir Virtues, a philosophical guide to a future worth wanting. So thank you, Shannon, for being here. Our second guest is uh, Nico um, Miai, who is the co-founder and president of the Future Society. He is also uh, very involved on several AI groups, governance groups, including with the OECD, the World Bank, and the MIT Media Lab. So thank you, Nico, for being here as well. And our final guest is uh, Anna Christmann, who is a member of the German Bundestag, and of course, a great friend of Aspen, Germany. Uh, she is the spokesperson for the Greens in the Bundestag, and is the chair of the Green Parliamentary Group in the AI Enquete Commission, which is doing all the work to kind of lay the groundwork for AI governance here in Germany, and happens to be the expert and point person for AI and health. So very busy time for her. Uh, thank you, Anna, for being here as well. So we are gonna start off with uh, Shannon and then just go through with some opening remarks. But the big question I have always to start with is, you know, when we talk about AI, what are we even talking about? What is artificial intelligence? And specifically, what is artificial intelligence in the context of, of this COVID-19 crisis? What are we talking about here? 
Great. Um, thanks, Tyson. And um, yeah, that's a that's an important question because I, I, I think we're already seeing a lot of confusion uh, around uh, what we mean uh, when we talk about AI. And then in the COVID context, I think that gets amplified. So artificial intelligence uh, is uh, an approach to uh, computing that has been an active area of research intermittently for many decades, uh, from uh, the middle of the 20th century onward, has waxed and waned in different periods. Uh, and as AI has gone through uh, these periods, which when we have a very strong, robust research program in AI, we often call that an AI spring. And when AI research seems to have stalled for a while, we, we kind of look back and call that an AI winter. As AI research has gone through uh, these phases, its definition has changed uh, uh, because what kind of research is defining uh, AI at that moment is whatever seems to be the most promising road forward. Um, and that's why there's some confusion about, about what the term means. So I actually find it useful then um, to use a kind of definition that I, I think has become more, more broadly accepted. Uh, that doesn't uh, tie the concept of AI to any particular methods uh, or techniques in computer science, because those are always changing. And we expect the methods that tend to dominate in AI research today may not be the methods that we associate with AI 10 years or 20 years from now. So a way of capturing AI that cuts across all of that historical variance is to talk about task-based intelligence comparisons where we say, look, uh, AI uh, involves a open-ended set of techniques for computing that allow machines to uh, perform tasks that uh, previously were uh, associated uh, exclusively with human intelligence. So when we think of things uh, being done by machines that previously uh, only humans uh, and only with the cognitive resources of our own brains uh, could have uh, completed, uh, then any machine that then develops the capacity to perform that task, we tend to uh, put under the umbrella of AI. So uh, human intelligence, of course, is a contested concept. Um, so it's not a clean, tidy definition, but it does allow us to have a kind of common sense grasp of the concept that when computers can do things that only hum uh, intelligent humans formerly could do, uh, we tend to call them AI. The kind of AI that today, and for the past, uh, you know, roughly a decade uh, has been dominant, uh, is a, a set of techniques in machine learning uh, that rely upon artificial neural networks and forms of mathematical modeling that are highly dependent on very large data sets. Uh, so that's why you might hear a lot about neural networks. You might hear a lot about deep learning, uh, uh, which is a form of machine learning that uh, uh, has a, a different kind of mathematical complexity. Uh, and you hear a lot about the connection between AI and big data, uh, because the kinds of techniques that have taken off uh, in AI over the past decade have been heavily data dependent uh, and data dependent on a scale that wasn't possible before uh, the internet era generated these massive stores uh, of, of data for us to, uh, to work with. So then we have this connection then between AI and data science. So let me talk a little bit about um, AI in the COVID context. So we have um, a lot of technologies like data science, cloud um, algorithmic decision-making, mathematical modeling, um, geolocational data uh, collection, you know, Bluetooth. None of these in and of themselves are AI. These are all tools that we've developed uh, uh, in, in some cases many, many decades ago, uh, in some cases more recently, but they're not built on a sort of typical AI foundation. But when you link these tools and capacities together, often they give us what AI delivers, which is the ability to perform kinds of analysis or kinds of tasks, uh, enhanced capabilities of thinking and judgment that weren't possible before. Um, so when we think about, uh, for example, contact tracing apps, which is one of the, uh, the uses of AI that we are hearing about more and more, 
one of the reasons why that uh, is getting linked to AI is not necessarily because it has to use, you know, artificial neural networks in it or, um, uh, or deep learning in any uh, uh, robust sense, but rather it's a combination of techniques that allows us to perform a task, namely contact tracing, uh, that previously was uh, an activity that public health experts would have to perform manually. And now we're developing ways of taking that intelligent task and trying to figure out how can we get machines to either uh, enhance our capabilities to do it as humans or automate part of that process. Um, but I'll, I'll just uh, um, you know, briefly say, what we're really gonna need to get at is what are the ethical implications uh, that we need to think about in a context where AI seems to offer all of these different opportunities, not just in contact tracing, uh, but in uh, uh, biomedical research, uh, uh, patient diagnosis and, and uh, triaging, um, projecting uh, and, and anticipating outbreaks and hotspots, controlling uh, uh, the behavior uh, of people in quarantine, all of these possibilities that AI seems to be able to help us with. Um, it's very important that we think about the conditions under which we make decisions that cannot be unmade mm. and the consequences of decisions that are made in a state of stress, uh, 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 urgency, uh, uh, global um, uh, instability, and so we're, we're making decisions under non-ideal conditions. We have to make decisions quickly to cope with this pandemic. Um, and, and we're not in the best position as individuals or as organizations or as nations to make ideal decisions when uh, we are under time constraints, resource constraints, and facing a global emergency. It's very important that we nevertheless do everything that's in our power to make sure that we make decisions about the use of AI uh, that we won't regret. Um, and that means not missing opportunities uh, uh, to contain this epidemic because we're too afraid of technology, but it also means not leaping forward recklessly with tools that may not offer very much benefit, but could expose us to a tremendous amount of risk. And we can talk more about the specifics later. I, that's a that's a great point to bring up that we this is and this is the point of this conversation is to take this back take a step back and say and to go uh, not in a fit of absent mindedness into developing technologies and processes that you know we're letting genies out of the bottle and sure. how do you get it back but before we go there Nico um, let's talk a little bit more about the potential here um, uh, and we'll have a poll in a second asking our participants and we're at about eighty participants right now to say where they see the most potential for AI and machine learning uh, applications in fighting COVID. But where do you see the potential? Um, where are your discussions in, these, in the groups that you're involved with um, bearing the most fruit? And, and where do you see some things where the, the, either they're, they're ri too risky or they're uh, unrealistic? Well, thanks a lot, uh, Tyson. I would not disagree with the definition that Shannon provided that what we're looking at right now at is, is a corpus uh, which there is no commonly accepted definition of AI and, and that's problematic to harness the power of AI in the age of COVID-19 because there are many different techniques, some of which are totally not mature in an industrial context. Deploying an artificial neural network over critical functions such as the approval of a, a clinical trial test, when you put at the center of the approval process a technological black box is going to be potentially problematic. And therefore, I think it's very important that we master the entire gamut of discipline within the field of computer science under the dream or the quest for artificial intelligence, ranging from deep reinforcement learning, but also uh, random forests and any other types of regressions which we are using every day in statistics. The good news is that the global pandemic that we're confronting is a, a tale of statistics. We were not prepared from a statistical perspective to anticipate the overflow in terms of a line of care management issues. In terms of uh, R, you know, the R, the R equals zero to three is a, is a question of statistics. And, and very much the new tale of AI, namely big data driven, machine learning centric AI systems are predominantly statistics driven systems. But, but in a lot of cases, they're immature, and so we need to go way beyond them. 
I'll give you a few examples, um, but I'll focus on one probably. One field in the domain of AI that has you know, called into action these various techniques, including, but not only, deep neural networks, is the field of natural language processing. Uh, this crisis that we're confronting to is a crisis where it's very difficult for policymakers and decision makers from the very local to the global stage to make sense of the complexity of the wave coming at us from obviously the uh, health related issues but also the social economic perspectives what is the gdp percentage post uh, gdp percentage point cost of one day of total lockdown is a question that we're struggling with uh, even today and that's why moving from a lockdown to a semi-lockdown is, is something that we would like to do knowing in the, the cost that is going to have on our systems. Well, it so happens that along with the response to that crisis, a number of actors, public, private, philanthropic, international, are opening a number of data sets and are putting them out there free to use. So there is no scarcity of potentially useful data the scarcity is making sense of the data and creating information on top of that data and knowledge, actionable knowledge on top of that data. And we at the Future Society are working with UNESCO, with the Office of the Secretary General of the uh, United Nations, UN Global Pulse, with WHO on creating precisely a sense-making platform using natural language processing to precisely scrap and process these incoming flows of data to create authoritative bodies of knowledge that can be used, for example, to benchmark um, behaviors uh, and uh, best practices in the field of contact tracing, but also to understand how we are moving towards uh, discovering a treatment and a vaccine, or understanding how we can deliver better modeling to do predictive line of care management, or obviously uh, epidemics uh, prediction. At the core of it, AI is, a, is framed as a general purpose technology and it's a tool for better optimization and prediction. And, and like Shannon said, think of all these tasks such as contact tracing where you have investigators behind their pads and phones trying to trace all these contacts, being overwhelmed with the volumes of uh, combinations of contacts. There, as an example, AI can really help and, and computing can really help in expediting uh, these processes. And that's the same for content moderation. The fight against fake news cannot be done only by uh, uh, human, humans. It has to be automated in some way. The problem here, of course, is that the opportunities in terms of automation and the challenges in terms of automation here are inextricably connected. We will get productivity gains out of mobilizing these tools, but at the cost of obviously privacy, fairness, there are a lot of false positives use AI to do serological tests or PCR tests, we know that there are false positives. You want to use facial recognition to identify someone potentially hidden in the crowd, which would be very offensive from a privacy perspective, obviously, but even from a performance perspective, there would be a lot of false positives. So it's, it's, it's fairness in terms of who is to suffer from this false positive, false negatives. And obviously, as I said before, a lot of these tools are not mature from an industrial perspective, we do not have the certification schemes, the auditing schemes that would allow us under the current emergency to place them at the center of our managerial tables without a risk. Delegating, in other words, critical decisions to machines at the core of which there are systems which are not well understood or even industrially mature is and represents some, uh, some kind of risk. And I'll close with, uh, with this example, contact tracing. We are looking at the tension between privacy on the one hand and the efficiency of contact tracing. And it's a very important conversation to, uh, to have. But let's also remember that contact tracing, automated or not automated, is only one piece of the puzzle. You don't have masks. You don't uh, apply social distancing. You don't massify the PCR and then tomorrow the serological tests. Contact tracing will not help you. In other words, technological solutionism today is even more dangerous than it was before. If we are to use AI, it should be in a wise and uh, I would say uh, reflexive way across the lines from line of care management, drug discovery, and obviously also contact tracing.
Thank you so much, Nico. That was excellent. A lot of stuff on the table. I mean, you, you talked about several of the risks, two which I thought were excellently uh, identified, which are, you know, is this technology industrially mature? And there have been some articles saying that AI will help us in the next uh, pandemic, but perhaps not this one. And we maybe we don't want to rush to deploy technologies that we don't really know what the second and third order effects are. And second, it's not a panacea. Like all this, we can't expect technology to save us if we're not putting forth the discipline and sometimes using uh, some more rudimentary technology and capacity like wearing a mask or practicing social distancing. Um, before we move on to Anna and get a little bit of a German political perspective, I want to uh, ask our audience to participate in a poll. We have a poll of potential applications of AI in the COVID-19 crisis, many of which uh, Nico just mentioned. And everybody who's participating uh, on the Zoom uh, application can participate in this poll. If you're calling in, unfortunately you can't, but I will read uh, the question and the, the potential answers. So the question is, where do you see the most potential for AI and machine learning applications in this, in the immediate COVID-19 crisis? So right now, uh, first, infection spread prediction. Second, app-based uh, tracking and movement monitoring. Uh, third, facial recognition technology. Uh, fourth, individual infection diagnosis. Uh, fifth, vaccine development. Uh, sixth, candidate selection for vaccine clinical trials. Uh, seven, hospital resource management and triage. And eight, uh, content management and disinformation takedown. So notice in, uh, disinformation takedown content monitoring, which uh, Nico mentioned. So I'm gonna give everybody a second to uh, participate in this poll. Uh, please feel free, everybody participate. We wanna have as many people participating as possible. And then we will go to uh, Anna for some reactions and also to hear about a little bit about what the uh, political Berlin is doing to, to try to get uh, the right uh, conditions for AI in this crisis. So are we good to go for the, get the results? All right, we have the results uh, up on the board. Uh, and just to give you guys some context, if you're calling in, uh, we, again, where is the most potential for AI applications? And with 36%, people see it in app-based tracking and movement monitoring. So a lot of the conversation is kind of coalescing around that. Uh, second and third were uh, vaccine development with 22% and infection spread prediction, which is of course related, but is sometimes is uh, like some of the early uh, predictive modeling that had been done on the infections breaking out in Wuhan isn't necessarily based on tracking. So, so very interesting results, a lot of plurality there. Uh, Anna, what do, you, what do you take from these results and does this, is this consistent with the conversations that you're having here in Berlin? Yeah, thank you so much, Tyson. Very interesting uh, discussion so far and very interesting results. Um, I actually uh, quite agree with the top three um, I just noted. So like the, the tracing app, the prediction and the development of, of a vaccine are, I think, uh, very important issues um, that can be handled at least partly uh, by um, AI techniques. And um, it's, it's, for, for me, it's very important that we try to use this right now against this crisis and, and to do this also with a, um, necessary political support. And maybe I would like to start with this statement that I think it's very important for Europe now to really find a way um, to support uh, AI in fighting the crisis and to show that we are able to do this on the basis of our values in Europe. Um, so data protection, data security, um, and to find a way to prove that this is possible uh, to do this successfully. Because otherwise there is a story, look at China, look at uh, other countries that use uh, very hard um, techniques and tools to really monitor the whole society and every single person. Um, and to use it in a very massive control uh, way. And we should show that we can use AI um, in fighting the crisis by still respecting our ideas of privacy and of individual rights. And I think that is very important that we show that this is possible because otherwise the world kind of thinks, okay, Europe is just a place where we think data protection is important, but we aren't able to apply the technique at all. 
So I think that is an important point right now. Um, and that brings me uh, to my second point that I think it's very important that politics now tries to use these uh, techniques and to um, like find a structure that makes it possible to use a technique because I observe that there is a lack between I, on the one side technical ideas that come up from everywhere right now. There are many people from the startup scene, from uh, the universities, from everywhere that provide ideas how we could use um, the technique uh, in various um, ways to fight uh, COVID-19. And then there's a politics sector that says, okay, that's very interesting and uh, please give us our, your ideas. But what, uh, what, how can we find a way that we identify which of these ideas is really valid and will be successful and will be go uh, to an application? And there we are too slow right now. I mean, we are still fighting with uh, the tracing app in Germany. And I think the tracing app is a very good example where we have this European proposition. We have PEPTT that made a proposition how it would work in Europe. And I think it's, it's a very um, uh, well um, sort of uh, developed concept uh, with respecting data privacy with a Bluetooth technology. I think it's quite promising. Um, but in Germany, we still don't have this app because there are problems in uh, doing the application that really uh, we could use it here. And I think we have to be faster in, in this kind of bringing it to an application. What I think we could use is something like an, a, a task force for these technical questions, which, is, uh, which consists of people from science, people from economy, people from politics that bring all the different perspectives together and decide which of the new ideas of uh, applying AI um, for the fight against COVID-19 could be successful and which could not and which we should follow up and now bringing into use for the, for the whole society. I think that is what we should do from the political um, perspective. And then maybe just one last comment in this first round uh, to the definition of uh, AI. Um, we, are, we have a lot of different uh, definitions. You, you mentioned that. And uh, I, I often hear the one that it's uh, AI is something that we used uh, to be a task that was performed by humans before and now it's possible to perform it by a computer program or a machine. But I think we should uh, remember that often uh, tasks that are very difficult for human beings can be very easy for an AI and tasks that are for us as human beings very easy can be very difficult for an AI system. So that's why it's so hard to program a robot uh, and make him autonomous, where it's, it's hard for him to like, bring us a glass of wine, but that is very easy for us. But it's very easy for machine learning to um, do statistics and to um, work with big data, which is very difficult for us as human beings. And I think that is an important hint where we should use this technique, especially when we have a situation like Corona, um, where it's all about how the uh, pandemic spreads and about statistics of the uh, pandemic. And that's something where AI is very good because it's about uh, yeah, performing statistics where we are as human beings not so good at. So that's what I would like to remember when we uh, ask ourselves, uh, what is AI in this context? Yeah, maybe so far for the beginning. Yeah, thank you so much, Anna. Um, I know you've been doing a lot of work to try to uh, make sure that Germany's efforts in, in AI R&D and, and deployment has been uh, done with Europe in mind to make sure that, uh, that the work is, is, is bringing the EU and that this is coordinated. Um, you know, just talking about uh, the, the tracking app uh, discussion, we see a lot of kind of national efforts. We see uh, PrEP PT, which is a European effort, but it's primarily German, uh, we have to be honest. Uh, we have Stop COVID in France. We have other examples in the Czech Republic and Poland, which are using uh, geolocation, much more centralized, not looking at the Bluetooth aspect, and is creating on some of the European values, particularly uh, those around informational self-determination um, and perhaps even the precautionary principle, how would you evaluate uh, Europe's role in, in coordinating the deployment of these new technologies? I mean, it's a difficult time for Europe uh, 
in the whole crisis, I'd say. It's not only when it comes to AI now that it's a hard time for Europe to really coordinate all the activities concerning COVID-19. And so we had this that borders had to close, um, which I think is very, um, very sad as a European. Um, but there we all we always had the, the conflicts to really say, try to, to do the thing in a coordinated way. And then countries started to do it themselves because they, they thought they now have to act. Um, so this is a situation that is difficult for Europe right now. Um, and this we can also see in the question of how we can use AI that uh, different countries try to use it in a different way. But still, I think the PrEP TT, it might be more German than from other countries, but still it uh, tries to be a European proposition and we had the commission to support it right now. And I think it's a good example how Europe can act um, in trying to use AI in this crisis. And it's important that uh, Europe works together because um, with data just from one country, it will be hard. We need data from whole Europe to really follow um, the pandemic situation and to be able to predict uh, how it will develop in future. So I think it's very important that Europe works together. It doesn't mean that we necessarily need the same app in every country, but they have to be able to work together and to, to be interoperable and things like that. So I still think it's a good example. We can always be a little bit faster in cooperating, but, uh, but still we try and I think that's, that's a good start. I think that's very optimistic and, and I'm glad to hear that level of optimism and, and let's hope it goes in that direction. Uh, Nico wanted to say something before uh, Nico jumps in, we're going to put up another poll, which is specifically related to this question. Um, how, and this is for the, the audience to participate, how do you assess the European Union role in the development of a tracking app? Uh, first point is the EU is too involved in the development of a tracking app. Second is the Europe, the European Union is sufficiently involved in the development of a tracking app. And third is the EU is not involved enough in the development of a tracking app. And what we just heard from Anna is the commission has uh, been involved in the PrEP PT discussions and is looking at coordination. Um, but we want to hear from you. What do you think? So we'll give that a second. And while the people are answering that, Nico, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, speak to this point as well? Yeah, well, I think it's very important not to mix things around here. Computing is not AI. An app is not AI. Digital mm. is not AI. And that's a problem with AI. AI is an obsolete concept where we get mixed up. Right. Let me be clear on something. PEPTA does not involve AI. It's very important. There is no artificial neural network. All the algorithmic processing which is done there is very basic, very simple. Is building a ledger, pinging contacts, and exchanges of signals between two phones based on a, a simple, uh, not so simple, but re relatively simple Bluetooth module. And that's very important. Why? If we abide by your European values and we do not make the adoption of this app mandatory and yet want to achieve over 60% adoption, we need that the public understands very well the detail of the protocol and that the public can trust the claims that we're making, we're making these claims over privacy protection because all the data stays inside the phone, because it's only Bluetooth and not geolocalization, and because the ways in which the data get out of the phone and get processed and informed back into the person who has been potentially infected and yet remains anonymous, this has to be very clear. That's my first one. The second one is, I'm afraid of one thing. PEPT is, is a great, uh, is a great uh, endeavor, uh, and indeed we need to rebalance a bit the things between uh, Switzerland, Germany, and the other countries. But it's very important that we build bridges between the, the initiative of Google and Apple and PEPT, because it's the same technological brick that is trying to be built here, on top of which nations are going to add UI and UX and other types of protocols to make the technological brick relevant in their local, legal, cultural context. But I'm a little bit afraid of the fact that, you know, maybe the Europeans are going to say, you know what, it's, it's time to push your industrial uh, um, interests here and disregard what Google and Apple are doing. And why is this problematic? The Bluetooth module was not designed to be used for this kind of applications. As a result, if we don't uh, enable ourselves to drill deep into the operating systems to mobilize these uh, modules, the risk is high that it, it will either not work very well 
or that the user experience in terms of battery consumption, for example, is going to be horrible. And Apple and Google together club 90% of the market in terms of operating systems of mobile phones. So the fact that they're stepping forward should be good news, even for we Europeans from a health perspective, not necessarily from an industrial perspective, but health perspective, hell yes. I think our duty as Europeans is to demand from Google and Apple accountability over what they're going to do because the European public do not trust, does not trust them. And, and the problem is that these multinationals have no one to confront in front of them. It would be great if the European Commission or the Office of the UN Secretary General would ask for the formation of an international panel, independent panel of experts to audit and to explore the technological break that Apple and Google are going to make. Why? Because even if it's open source, and that the community of developers organically audit the code, the public will not understand that. It's very important that the public build trust over what has been claimed. And in the current context, we need to put in front of these big giants sufficient auditing expertise uh, supported by political authority, and I think that the European Commission and the Office of the Secretary General of the UN can put together such high-level independent panels to do that and build trust. Shannon, you, I think you wanted to jump in on this. Is, did I get you right? Yeah, I just wanted to add to, the, uh, to this point. Um, we talk about these contact tracing apps and um, as impressive as uh, the privacy preserving uh, design has been for, for many of these, uh, I don't think we're paying enough attention uh, to the point uh, that Nicholas just was making about uh, public trust uh, being, being the barrier. So um, even if uh, experts are comfortable with uh, the way these tools are designed. Uh, that doesn't mean that that will translate uh, to the general public. And what hasn't been uh, discussed enough, I think, is that these apps will only work if they acquire somewhere between 70 and 80 uh, percent adoption, depending upon the, the, the country and the proportion that have smartphones, uh, to, to really work the way that we want them to. And that means getting 70 to 80% of the population to be comfortable that downloading this uh, app and, and activating it is going to uh, be compatible with their safety and long-term well-being. And if we look at Singapore, which was one of the first countries to begin to launch an app like this, they never got higher than 12% uh, uptake and not even close to the target that we will need. And, you know, AI has a much bigger and I, granted, uh, Nicholas is, is right, we aren't even talking about AI, but people are already associating AI because of Google, because of Apple, because governments are talking about it as, as if that makes it better, right? That it's connected to AI. But the problem is there's a huge trust gap in many countries around AI. People are less comfortable with AI as a tool um, for some good reasons and some misinformed reasons. And as a result, my worry is that we aren't focusing enough on how to be transparent with the public and how to very quickly ramp up public understanding both of the need uh, and of, uh, and of the, the privacy uh, considerations and safety mechanisms uh, that ordinary people can understand whether or not they have a background in data science uh, or, um, uh, or you know, operating system design. So I, I have a ton of questions. Uh, both of you guys have been very provocative and I, I, I just have so many ideas and questions that I want to ask you guys. But uh, we have a lot of questions from the audience and this is really their time to start to ask questions. So um, if you have any questions, if you want to ask your question yourself, all you have to do is raise your digital hand. Uh, down below and we will make sure that we get your question. Or if you're calling in, we have about uh, six uh, people calling in on the phone, um, you have to dial star nine. So uh, we're getting in some questions right now. I also have a couple of written questions. Feel free to write your questions in the Q&A and we'll get those. Uh, before we do that, let's just see the results of that poll. We've, we've moved on a little bit in the conversation to some other areas, but uh, uh, just to see do, how do people assess the uh, European Union role in the development of a tracking app 72% say it is not sufficiently involved in the development of a tracking app. So overwhelmingly majority there, maybe we can talk about that in, in the Q&A as well. So we have some questions. Let's start with uh, somebody who has a question uh, calling in, AVJ. Uh, AVJ, please address, uh, say your name and affiliation and tell who you're addressing your question to. You're on. Hi, my name is August von Joost. Can you hear me? Yep. 
my name is August von Joost. I'm a Berlin entrepreneur, a member of the board of trustees of Aspen and amongst others running for the time being a VC fund with uh, 50 million euros capital uh, on uh, industry 4.0, which is a lot involved with AI. My comment or my question is, I think there is too much talking about how AI and those apps could um, involve or let's say hinder the freedom aspect of if I see what the government does now basically cuts us into a form where we will survive I think there's no question at all that everybody who has a smartphone needs to have that app that's it bingo nothing else if we are being locked up at home we also can have an app and if we don't want to be locked up we should have the app and prove that we have it and that should be our gateway to the outside and everybody who doesn't want to have it should stay at home. It's we're talking about survival and not pleasure. Thank you. Can't hear you. Right. Who uh, do you want to address that question to? Uh, to Nicholas. Okay, Nicholas. Thanks, uh, August. August. It's really a great question and there is a conversation right now mounting in France along the same lines. And it goes like this. If you are forcing us by law to stay home through a lockdown, in France, the lockdown is legally enforced. You can't get out, one. If second, when the vaccine is out, you're going to force us to get vaccinated, then this value of ours that says that we should elect to put the app on our phones should be washed away. Let's make the app mandatory and create the conditions so, so that, as you said, either you download and use the app because it's anonymous, because it's so privacy protecting, we should, we have, it's the golden hour of GDPR, except that GDPR really insists on informed consent. At the core of the problem that we're confronted with today is this notion of informed consent. And what, what you're saying, and a lot of people are starting to say that in France is, well, but our freedom is already affected. Here is what I see as the problem. Should we, and the level of lethality of that pandemic is, we don't know yet exactly what are the figures, but it hovers around from one to 3%, which is big, which is huge. We're talking about hundreds of millions uh, within the global population. But at the same time, some would argue it's small. So what is it that as a collective, as a nation, as a continent, we want to put in the, in the balance? What is it that we want to do? Do we really want to fall in a way, in, in my view, foolishly in the false trap of it's either freedom or techno surveillance. I think it's very important to try and get away from that false tension. And I think that through user experience and user interface, UI, UX, through the right kind of outreach, we can make it in a way to resist the temptation to make that app in a way, excuse my language, but foolishly mandatory to use for every citizen. We can do better than that. We should do better than that, more so because those in the post-blanket lockdown who are at risk of being more affected by uh, uh, the prevention of their uh, individual freedoms are the so-called vulnerable people. And the vulnerable people are mostly, in, in statistics, aged people, the elderly. It so happens that the elderly are not so, uh, I would say, used to using this kind of quite complex app. And, and, and not so used to understanding the protocol behind these apps. So we need to be also careful vis-a-vis -vis not um, enlarging the digital divide on that. That's why it's a, but you're right, that's a great question. I, I won't sweep it under the carpet. We need to discuss that more and address it from a values perspective. And again, as per GDPR, it's about informed consent, not about mandatory use of a, a digital service. I think that, that's an important uh, uh, delineation, important line to put out there. We have a question that's somewhat related to that, and I'm going to, uh, we have a couple of written questions. I'm going to uh, give this to Shannon, um, which is uh, maybe this is a little bit of a, of a false equivalency, uh, as, as Nico was mentioning, but Patrick asks, where do you draw the line between uh, tracking apps, especially if backed by AI, and as, as Nico mentioned, some of the technology being used in uh, PEPPT is pretty unsophisticated, uh, is not using AI, but where do you draw the line between tracking uh, apps which do use AI and the Chinese, what he calls the Chinese uh, social conformity tracking systems? So uh, that's a great question. And I think this comes back uh, to what was just being uh, discussed. I think 
you know, when we think about, for example, uh, mandatory systems uh, of monitoring uh, and behavior control, uh, what we're talking about is crossing a line into an area that previously, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, has been seen as uh, off the table, right? Um, uh, and the worry is that once people become comfortable with um, a regime, even if it's instituted under conditions of emergency for initially for very good reasons. Uh, the worry is that once people become comfortable uh, to a uh, sort of mandatory re regime of population and behavior control through technology, uh, that it becomes very, uh, very difficult to roll that back. Um, because there's always uh, potentially going to be another threat. There's always potentially uh, going to be another uh, uh, outbreak somewhere or a, um, uh, or a uh, risk that the government is going to find uh, very tempting uh, to exploit for these purposes. And this is why I think uh, the discussion is so difficult. If we, w if, if we were just talking about saying, okay, we're gonna do this, and we all know that this is a sort of temporary phase where we're going to uh, require compliance with this uh, digital contact tracing regime. And then uh, we know that in you know eight months or so, or when the vaccine arrives, uh, that this will all be rolled back uh, and everything will go back to the way it was. Uh, that would be uh, a different kind of decision to make, but, but people know that's not the decision that we're making. Mm. We're making a decision about what kinds of risks we're willing to accept and what kinds of uh, liberties we're willing to give up even sort of temporarily. Um, so I would agree with, with Nicholas that um, we need, at the very least, I think we need to, to quickly roll out um, ways of engaging the public that gain their cooperation and trust. Um, and, and do what we can, everything we can, uh, to make that work uh, before crossing that line uh, that I'm not sure we can walk back across. Yeah, especially we, knowing, let's be very practical here. Let me give you an example over what Shana said. Imagine that by 2030, we ask all citizens to build a CO2 emission account and tracking system because we know that we are failing at delivering the right kind of measures to deal with climate change. So this kind of surveillance and monitoring and prediction at an individual level and modeling would be potentially very useful for CO2 tracking, CO2 emission. And well, that, that's a practical example of the kind of things that happen when we cross that line. Mm -hmm. Very important uh, points about how can you make this temporary? Are we letting, how do you put a toothpaste back in the, in the toothpaste uh, bottle? Um, we have a question that's somewhat related from Ned Wiley, and I'm going to ask this to Anna. Um, he, Ned Wiley asks, are European, uh, are European GDPRs, GDPR regulation, inconsistent with tracking and people monitoring technologies simply in principle? That is, if you want to track uh, an individual, uh, how can you guarantee anonymity? How can you guarantee the right to be forgotten? Uh, and I guess the broader question that he's asking is, are you happy with the guardrails being put in place when we're having these discussions around tracking apps, particularly in the context of GDPR? I mean, that's a great question because of the term of tracking. And I'm uh, the uh, whole time I'm thinking uh, tracking is not the right word here. We are talking about tracing apps in Europe. And that's an important difference because we just don't want to track where people are going. And um, geo, it's not about uh, geodata. It's about contact persons. So it's just about tracing the contacts that people had. And we don't know where they were and uh, at what places they stay. And it's all just on their phone until they say, okay, I give my data because I now have COVID-19 and I want to be uh, a part of uh, the health system here and share my data uh, with the health system. But then I just share the contacts I had and not uh, the places where I've been. So it's not tracking, it's tracing, I think, and that's the first very important difference. And then I agree completely with the question that when we talk about a mandatory app, I think we destroy the trust in this app. So I think that is not a good discussion we are um, having. Uh, we also have it in, in Germany a little bit that some 
say we should have a mandatory app, but I think people won't use it when they think it's mandatory, they lose trust in it. And the support is not uh, not so low in Germany. We had surveys with more than 60%, 70% that say that such an app uh, will be an important um, part of the fight against COVID-19 and they want to use it. But I think it's really important that it's voluntary, anonymous, and uh, very simple that people understand how they can use it. And uh, I don't think it should be mandatory. And I would also question how we should, uh, how we could do it mandatory because it's not easy to uh, make people download an app on their phone. I mean, will the police come to me at home and uh, make me download the app or how should that work? So I don't think that is a very fruitful discussion. So I think there's really a proposal on the table how we could use such an app um, on the basis of European uh, GDPR. And I think that's very good. And of course, um, I, I shared the comments before that it's not AI in this app. Um, that's a completely different thing. Um, and that's a different discussion how we could use the fight against COVID-19 uh, more than we are doing until now. Mm. We have a question from, uh, so we're, we're getting towards the end. So we've got a couple questions that I want to get in. We have Gunter T, we have uh, Nicholas Kassoff, and then we have a couple of written questions. So I'm going to just uh, close the question period. But uh, Gunter T, you are on. Please identify yourself and also who you'd like to ask your question to. Yes. Um, hello. My name is Gunter from the company GPS. And can you hear me? It's breaking up so, a little bit. Okay. A little bit louder now? Okay. That's good. Um, what I'm missing in the whole discussion is, you know, uh, Nicholas was just mentioning, you know, we don't have to mix, you know, with apps and AI. And so what I'm missing is um, we are not talking about AI light and AI strong. Because uh, when it comes, you know, to machine learning, that's based on mathematical methods, which are, well, have been invented, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And what we need, you know, the confidence interval with machine learning is the maximum is 75 percent and with you know new methods i mean creative automatic programming or going on the evolutionary algorithm that's much better and you can reach 95 to 97 percent that means you know the cycle of innovation can be shortened because you know for a development of um, a blockbuster today it needs 13 years and, you know, when I saw the prediction that, you know, Johnson, Johnson or Pfizer was saying, well, uh, that we will have a um, vaccine in 10 months, I don't believe it, to be honest. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, that's it for the moment. And who Sorry. do you, and I guess that question is to Nico. Thank you so much, Gunter, for your question. Um, you're talking about uh, maturation cycles and the acceleration and, and the confidence interval. Um, what do you think? Are you, do you share his skepticism and can AI play a role in developing a vaccine? Yeah, I, actually, I, I disagree with the, the majority of the people who voted for the first question of the uh, survey and would have said that I really believe in the power of AI, meaning big data-driven, machine learning-centric AI systems in the field of drug discovery. I think that there, the number of combinations is so high, number one. The competence of the operator and the users is very high. So the risk of people using this in a Frankensteinish way without knowing what they're doing is, is, is exists, but is less than in other fields. And more importantly, AI will here point in a direction. And yet, we will have to investigate using scientific method to get to that direction, especially when we get in the field of clinical trials. I know that people are trying to push innovative clinical trial designs, including using AI, and there's a lot of interesting conversation there, but I think it's drug discovery and modeling of combination of existing FDA approved molecules here can be a very interesting and fertile ground. That, that, that would have been my, my first because I totally agree with you, uh, Gunther, and I agree with you over the fact that machine learning algorithms date back decades, what is new, is the stocks and flows of data, which did not exist at that time, and the compute scalable, available at a low cost anywhere, anytime, including as we're speaking right now, uh, to empower and, and put into motion these algorithms. That cycle is new, and the industrial adoption of that cycle is brand new. That's why I would limit it to areas where the level of expertise and the scientific methodology rules. Okay, that is a, a great point to go into our final poll, and then we're going to go to the last question. 
um, are if we can put up the last poll, which is kind of related to the first poll. Um, in the first uh, poll, we asked, you know, where do we see the greatest potential? And here we ask, where do you see the greatest ethical challenges in AI and machine learning applications in the immediate COVID-19 crisis? So we have, again, the same uh, uh, possible answers. The first one is infection uh, spread prediction. The second is app-based tracking and movement monitoring. The third is a facial recognition technology. The fourth is individual infection diagnosis. The fifth, what we were just talking about, vaccine development. The sixth is candidate selection for vaccine clinical trials. The seventh, and this is an interesting one, which we haven't really discussed, is, is hospital resource management and triage. And the final is a content management and disinformation takedown. So I'll give you guys a second to, to answer that question. And while we do, let's get uh, the question from uh, uh, Niklas uh, Kasov. Uh, Niklas, you're on the line. Please uh, direct your question at somebody and introduce your affiliation as well. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is a PhD researcher at the Hertie School in uh, Berlin and looking at the use of digital technologies in fighting corruption and I'm also a part of the um, Aspen Next Gen um, AI network. So um, one thing that I found really interesting is, I mean, we're having a discussion on AI, but we end up talking a lot about the contract tracing app and that's sort of like very uh, particular in the discussion that we have currently, like this app really dominates a lot and a lot of people pin hopes on this app and also on AI to get off out of this very difficult situation but I mean in all honesty this won't be the case right it's like neither artificial intelligence nor an app will get us out of the lockdown we're in um, both because it can't replace the measures um, it can't actually fulfill lots of the hopes that many people pin on it but also the technology just isn't ready yet I mean already the <coughs> Ministry of Health in Germany like wanted to announce an app this week but they pushed it back to four weeks from now like neither google nor apple are ready yet so like the pet and the d3pt consortia had like uh, a big fight last night uh, which they I think solved a little bit but the question is like how do we moderate this discord to so discourse to sort of manage expectations both on apps but also on ai in general so do not ho pin too much hope and i suppose this uh, question would go most adequately to anna Chrisman. All right, Anna, maybe you can answer this and maybe Shannon as well, because she also mentioned the 12% adoption rate in Singapore. Please. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I completely agree that the app is not uh, the most important thing to uh, fight the crisis and uh, to get out of the lockdown. I think it's one part of the puzzle, but uh, not uh, the whole thing. And I also think it dominates uh, the debate too much, but it's just, I think it's an example that is easy to understand how we could use a digital tool in this crisis and that's why everybody uh, debates about it because it's easy to understand how we could use it and um you're right it's it's not uh, there is not a app that is ready i mentioned it before we uh, still lose time to to have an app um so i think we could um uh, make more pace in these kind of questions if we would have things like technical task forces that i mentioned before where we bring all the people together because in germany now we have the thing that the guy who's uh, in charge of data protection on the federal level he has some questions and it's good that he has some questions but all of these kind of people should be in the process right from the beginning so that we can uh, have a solution from the beginning that already includes all the different perspectives from politics, from data protection, from science. Um, so we get faster in developing the things and bring them into application. I think uh, we miss such uh, a group that can um, fasten things up. That's very important. And then we should also come to a state where it's not only the app, but many different digital tools. I won't speak about AI tools only, but about digital tools in a variety um, we had maybe last sentence to that as uh, the hackathon V versus virus in Germany, where very many teams provided ideas how we could use digital uh, tools um, to fight the crisis. And now they are on the table, but nothing happens basically. Mm. There is no funding for it, no budget. And I think there we have to do the next step to also fund these teams and bring the ideas to really uh, to be applied in this crisis and that very fast. And I think this is a missing link right now um, in our situation. Um, Shannon, maybe you want to add something on, on this point about, you know, technology as a panacea. What is, are we investing too much hope in this area? And Definitely. maybe use that as a final word, then we'll take a look at the polls and we'll wrap up. 
Yeah, just very quickly. I, I just want to reinforce this notion that um, we, ne we need to avoid AI solutionism, which is, uh, again, pinning our hopes on AI is a thing that's going to get us out of uh, the situation that we're in or the problem uh, that uh, uh, has been created uh, largely as a result of human failures of planning, of judgment, of collective action. And instead, I think we need to think about a human support, I'm sorry, AI support of human intelligence and AI support of weakened human institutions that really we need to look much more closely at uh, so that this uh, doesn't happen again. Because frankly, we wouldn't need to be having the debate about a contact tracing app if we had contained this pandemic and we had the information and we had the ability to contain this uh, before we got here. So I, I hope that we focus on failures uh, of collective action and planning, failures of, uh, uh, of cooper social cooperation and information sharing. Uh, we knew a pandemic was coming. We knew it uh, 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 five years ago, we knew it two years ago, we knew it six months ago, we just didn't know when. Um, but we could have had contingency plans in place and known exactly what sort of app was ready to launch when it happened, if we needed an app, right? Mm. But we're here having these debates in real time as the, the uh, pandemic is progressing. So I'd like to just close by saying COVID is, it was an ethical failure of human institutions to prevent uh, an existential threat that we knew was coming. Um, and AI isn't going to solve that problem for us. Um, but AI should be one of the tools that we use uh, to strengthen the institutions so that the next time we're faced with a threat like this, uh, they're quick enough and strong enough to, and coordinated enough uh, to respond effectively. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, and I, it's a great note to end on, and I'm definitely adopting into my vocabulary the term AI solutionism. Um, that is uh, definitely a trap that I think uh, we, especially as Americans, you and I sometimes can fall into with regard to technology generally. Um, results of the uh, final poll related to um, ethical challenges, and then we'll wrap up. So we uh, have a look here, where do we find the greatest ethical challenges? And 42% of participants said hospital research management and triage. Um, I think that, that is a very uh, ethically fraught territory, um, something that definitely needs to be discussed. Uh, when we saw the most acute capacity bottlenecks in, in Italy, this was definitely a question that people were dealing with ethically uh, and morally. And, and it's definitely something that we need to discuss about in, in a technology space because there's clearly um, help that can be provided by technology in optimizing resources, but there are also big ethical questions. Um, I want to thank all the panelists, Nico, Shannon, and Anna, for this great discussion. We're going to continue this, uh, this series with Google um, at the end of the month on April 30th, a German language discussion with Saskia Esken. Uh, on uh, German tech policy. I think a lot of these questions are going to come up in that in that talk. Um, and then uh, a week later, we're going to have a discussion on Germany mobilizing tech with some people from the economic ministry, um, with uh, some people from the startup community, uh, specifically to talk about the hackathon and the results that Anna mentioned and how they are going to be operationalized. I think we're all very, very um, anxious to hear how this, the rubber is going to hit the road on this. Uh, but with that, I want to thank everybody for participating and hope to see you soon. Happy Friday and have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.